Welcome to this SE22 presentation about OpenMP. This presentation is part of the OpenMP Booth Talk series. My name is Ruth van der Pas and my background is in mathematics and physics. Previously I worked at Philips, the electronics company, the University of Utrecht, Convex Computer, SGI and Sun Microsystems. Nowadays I work in the Oracle Linux engineering organization and I've been involved with OpenMP since the introduction. I was at SGI when OpenMP 1.0 came out. I was excited back then and I'm still very excited. And it may be uh, not so easy to imagine, but at the time that OpenMP came out, it was a revolution. There were all these different parallel programming models. Nothing was compatible. Uh, porting one, a parallel application from one model to another was a major effort, sometimes not even possible because of uh, the difference in functionality. So it was really, really hard, let alone that you could take one application, one, one, one code, one source code, and run it on multiple different platforms in parallel. OpenMP changed all of that, and I'm, I'm, again, I'm very excited about it. I'm also passionate about application performance, and in particular, in combination with OpenMP. But this talk is going to be a little bit different than what I usually talk about, and this is why I gave it a title, What Could Possibly Go Wrong Using OpenMP? And the obvious answer is nothing. Of course, nothing can go wrong, everything is perfect, and there are no, no problems at all. But we all know better. Of course, um, there are things to, to discuss and talk about, and that's what I'm going to do in this presentation. So where could things go wrong? And before I'm going to try to answer that question, I, we need to sort of agree on some sort of definition of wrong. And I distinguish two things that can go wrong, two categories that can go wrong. You get the wrong result. You get an incorrect answer. That's, of course, a game over. Everything stops there. you you got to go back to the drawing board and fix any bug or bugs that you may have put into your code when you used OpenMP. You could also have um, a correct result, but the performance is disappointing. The scalability is not what you would expect it to be, so that's an OpenMP performance issue. And I'm going to talk about the top three of both categories, but by far the focus will be on the correctness side. I've given several talks in the past about OpenMP and performance. Many of them are recorded and are available through the... Uh, OpenMP YouTube channel. The link is given on this uh, this slide. So again, the focus will be on correctness, but once in a while I'll say something about performance just because I can't resist to do so. Let's first look at the big picture. What What is OpenMP really about? We start with an application, Decode, and um, supposedly that's a sequential application. Then you use the OpenMP controls to turn it into a parallel program. You're going to uh, add directives, uh, pragmas, you're going to use the runtime functions maybe to specify what you want to do and to implement your, your parallelism in a way. You then take a, a compiler that understands OpenMP, so a compiler with OpenMP support, uh, and you have it, the compiler translated to a parallel executable that's using OpenMP during the execution. And in doing so, it needs a library. It needs a runtime library that, um, that it relies on to actually make things happen in parallel for you. And I identified three different places where things could go wrong. It could go wrong in the OpenMP runtime library. There could be a bug, but that's extremely, extremely unlikely. That's, um, I almost, almost wouldn't say it, but you can never exclude it. What could happen um, is a, a glitch in the compiler, especially when it's a new feature that hasn't really been matured, hasn't been really well tested, has some other older features, can happen. Again, not very likely. By far, what I see is the majority of the issues that, that, that arise in an OpenMP program are at the user level. You made some sort of a mistake, and as a result, you get the wrong answers. And um, those three exclamation marks could actually be five or ten, because, again, that's really where most of the errors come from. And with this presentation, I'm going to talk about that and hopefully give you some tips how to avoid some of those mistakes. Before I continue, you may think that my examples are very simple and, and trivial, and they are, but they're all derived from real applications. I found them in real applications. I stripped them, I made them simple so they fit on a slide and I can explain them within a reasonable amount of time. But uh, don't forget, they are taken from the real world. So what's my top three when it comes to wrong answers? And um, this is uh, some sort of a temporary, momentarily a snapshot um, 
Uh, these are the big things that I see. There are more, uh, but I want to focus on these three for now. First of all, and that seems so trivial, the code has been parallelized while whatever you parallelized wasn't parallel. But that can actually happen very easily. It could be a large application uh, with a very complex call tree, and somewhere deep inside is something that that violates parallelism, so you get the wrong result. And um, I'll talk a little bit about that. Another area where things may get tricky is the scoping, where you need to specify whether a variable is private or shared. There are rules for that. There are implied rules in OpenMP. If you don't say that yourself, the system will make a decision for you. Uh, you could make a mistake in, in both. You, maybe you don't understand the rules well enough to apply them correctly, or you made a mistake. And I'll talk about that as well. And the last category is uh, data races. They, they're nasty, they're mean, but I have to talk about them. So let's start with incorrect parallelization. I have a very simple loop where I, uh, I assign to a vector A, I'm using another vector B, and some scalar val value, which is color-coded in red. My claim is, as written, this cannot be parallelized. And the reason is, is there's a dependency in it. Uh, you need to have a new result uh, computed before you can compute the next result. And that's better seen when you look at a version that doesn't have that scalar variable. This is doing the same. And what you see here is A of I depends on A of I minus 1 plus some something else. Let's say B of I. The key here is A of I depending on A of I minus 1. And what that means is that I first need to compute A of I minus 1 before I can compute A of I. So there's a notion of time. There's a notion of before and after. And when you have that notion of time in a, in a program, you can't parallelize that part of the code. Uh, parallelism means that anything can happen at any time and it should not affect the results. Well, that's far from the case here. So this is, as I hope it's clear, this is not something you can parallelize in a straightforward way. Now, I know there are ways to do this, the ways around it, and I worked on them before, uh, but I just want to get the message across that there is a notion of time, in a way, in this loop, and that means um, it's not parallelizable, again, as written. So, of course, I parallelized it. That's the beauty of OpenMP. You can do whatever you want. So I put in a Pragma OMP Parallel 4. I ran it. I compiled with GCC with the uh, dash F OpenMP option. And I set the number of threads to 4. I had a loop of only 10, 10 elements long, so I'm computing 9 new elements here. And guess what? 6 out of the 9 are wrong. And what I'm showing here uh, as a ray ref is the, is the reference, the correct uh, data, the reference data. And you see that um, six out of those are wrong. They're marked in red and with a star, so um, clearly they're very wrong. What is scary, in a way, is that three out of these results are correct. They're, they're correct, so they're good. Now imagine that this um, this is somewhere deep inside your code, deep down the call tree, and the values sort of propagate through the through the code, and maybe you have a, a kind of a solver that dampens out high frequencies. Errors could sort of disappear, but they're still there. So it's pretty scary when you think about it especially the fact that some results are correct. I also parallelized the um, the other version. Again, that was also the wrong thing to do because it's not parallel. And what we see now is quite interesting. We see that in this case, six results are correct and four are wrong. And the wrong results are different wrong results than we saw before. That's, that's all in the nature of parallel programming and uh, that can happen. So both, of course, are wrong. I should not have parallelized them and the behavior is slightly different. So what are the lessons learned here, or at least what I tried to convey? First of all, um, don't parallelize code that's not parallel, uh, especially since well, you shouldn't do it anyhow. But when you when you do so, you may get wrong results sometimes, maybe. As I was sh as I was showing, uh, in the same vector, some results are okay, others are wrong, and that's really a nightmare to debug. And I want to share a simple trick. Um, it works only one way, but it's highly effective. Let's say you want to parallelize a loop. This is applicable to loops only, and you're not sure whether that loop is um, is actually uh, allowed to run in parallel. It's a very complex uh, piece of code. A simple trick is you, you run the loop backwards. You start with the last iteration, and you end with the first one. And if you get the wrong results, you know there's a dependence on earlier computed results. And when you have that kind of dependence, you can't parallelize it as written. Maybe you can rewrite things and and do something, but as written, you can't you can't execute it in parallel. 
Unfortunately, if you get the right results, you still don't know. Uh, you could have been sort of lucky or unlucky, depending on uh, how you look at it. I want to um, I want to conclude this um, this case uh, with some tips. First of all, uh, use a profiling tool to see where the time is spent. Uh, you don't want to spend any effort on parts of the code that don't contribute to the to the performance. But let's say you do, and you find a code a piece of code that's sequential. Well, try to find if there's a parallel version of the algorithm that you're using. That could be. That'll be great. You can use it. When you do so, be aware. Uh, there are some parallel algorithms that are, that are significantly less efficient than their sequential counterpart, and uh, that sort of slippery slope because you first you lose a lot of performance, and then you try to regain that by going parallel. So be a little bit careful there, but definitely that's the first thing to do. See if you can leverage other work done. If you can't, a trick that I uh, successfully used in the past is isolate whatever is bad in terms of uh, parallelization, the sequential part, and parallelize whatever is left. That's highly effective because uh, probably in that sequential part you don't spend a lot of time, so you can save the most out of it. When you do so, be a little bit careful that you often need to propagate scalar variables into arrays or other data structures that could cause extra cache and memory traffic. So uh, don't declare temporary arrays that are 10 gigabyte in size because they'll blow away every every cache advantage that you have. So do that with a little bit of um, a strategy. But again, it's highly rewarding and it maximizes the parallelism that you have. The second category of wrong answers is related to uh, uh, not using the scoping rules in the right way. And I could not resist to put an error like that into the previous example, which is shown at the bottom here. It's a little bit small, but it was about that uh, scalar variable uh, which stored the previous value of A. And I didn't say anything. Note that I didn't say anything on my pragma. So the default OpenMP rules say this is a shared variable. Well, uh, as I'll show in a minute when I talk about data races, that will give a data race on that variable, and that's wrong. That will give you wrong results. So what happened was that I didn't fully understand the default rules. I was relying on them. Maybe I didn't even realize I was relying on them, but it gave me the wrong result. And that's a common pitfall. So try not to rely on those default rules unless you understand them. And there's some, there's a, there's one or two simple cases that actually are good to rely on, and I'll I'll cover that on um, on a future slide. But it's not the only mistake that people make. The other one is about private variables. Uh, recall, private variables are undefined outside of the parallel region. So the moment that I um, that I assign a value to um, to a, a private variable outside of my parallel region, it doesn't it doesn't help. And let me sh show you the example. Here in this loop, I have a, a variable called my var, and um, it's used inside the loop. It's used inside the parallel four, and I nicely initialize it to 10, but it's, it's not defined inside the parallel region, and the value outside doesn't matter. It's like it's a different variable. So um, this is illegal OpenMP. My var is um, is not 10. Certainly you cannot assume it. Maybe today the compiler does that for you, but you can't really assume it. It's definitely uh, incorrect OpenMP. So that's not good. Luckily, there's an easy way out, and that's called the first private clause. The first private clause does, as the name suggests, what it does. It will make the variable private. That's what we want. But it will also pre-initialize the value uh, with with the initial value that it had. So it had a value of 10. So every thread will get a copy of my var and it will be pre-initialized to 10. And that's exactly what we want. Like, likewise, you can save the last value out of uh, out of a parallel region. Although sometimes uh, you have to think about what does last mean in a parallel program. But that's all well defined and that's the last private clause. So some lessons learned here, I hope. Um, one rule that I actually like um, is that um, I like to declare variables local to a code block because they're, when they're local to a code block, they're automatically privatized. So I don't have any of that hassle. I know they're private. Of course, I need to give them values within the code block, but that's actually quite a natural thing to do. So uh, take that, um, use that to your advantage. It, it's quite powerful. Uh, any variable that you cannot treat that way, you I would re strongly recommend to scope them yourself. Um, uh, it, it saves you tons of trouble later on, unless you really know the rules uh, very well. And it's not as hard as it may seem. You think about uh, the nature of the variable and, and who's going to be interested in the value, and then you make your decision. 
and it's definitely very rewarding when it comes to avoiding bugs. The third one in this category of wrong answers is called the data race. A data race occurs if all of the following conditions are met. We have multiple threads, so at least two threads or more. They access the same memory location, so the same variable, if you want to want to say it like that, concurrently, so at the same time. And at least one of those accesses modifies the contents of that location, so you're changing that variable. And there's no control to guarantee that that happens in the right way, so exclusive access. And what, it, what happens is that what other threads then read, if they read that variable, they pick up some sort of random value. And uh, what that means is a data race leads to silent data corruption. And that's really bad because that just happens in your code. You have no idea it's happening, but at the end, uh, your results are wrong. And um, they're also non-deterministic. So uh, the results may vary and probably will vary across identical runs. You do exactly the same. You run the same run script and the results are, are different. That's actually a first sign of a data race. If that happens, then most likely there's a data race somewhere in your application. So yes, they are mean and ugly, and um, that's why I'm talking about them. And here's a, here's a very simple example. It's like a template example. I have um, the, the loop here sums up the elements of a vector, vector A, and stores uh, the values in the variable, and I made that variable shared. So in my parallel region, I have a shared variable. And what I did, I just created the conditions for a data race. Because uh, we execute that parallel region on multiple threads, I assume. Uh, they all read and write that shared variable. So they definitely uh, modify that same memory location. And there's no way that I protect that uh, such updates uh, to make sure that happens in a controlled way. So this example meets all the three conditions, and it's a data race. And it's like a standard example. Luckily, um, this is a very common case as well, like summing up the elements of a vector. And it's part of what is called a reduction operation. There are several types of reduction operation. The, the specifications um, very clearly define what is a reduction operation. For example, the maximum of a vector is, um, is a reduction operation. So um, the syntax is that you, you say, I'm going to have a reduction, and you're going to give the operator, which is the plus, the addition, and the variable. The variable is implied to be shared, so you don't, uh, you can't uh, de define that as shared. It is a shared variable. Um, that's the whole idea. And the compiler actually generates pretty complex code um, behind the scenes. Uh, each thread will do a partial summation. It will, it will sum up a part of vector A. All those partial contributions will then be merged into the final, uh, final variable in the right way. So very convenient, very simple to implement. And reductions are so important that nowadays there's a reduction clause for tasking, and you can have your own reduction operation. It's called user-defined reduction, UDR, and you can define what you call a reduction, and um, that's for more complex cases. So the um, the morale for this um, this part is data races are very nasty, they're very ugly, and um, luckily OpenMP has some support to help you to avoid them. If it's less... Um, it's less easy if it's not like a reduction. There are constructs that help you to avoid data races, um, like atomic operations, critical regions, barriers, locks. They're all there to help you avoid uh, data races. Please use them. Take a look at the, at the specifications. Use them where you can, and they're definitely going to make your life a lot easier when it comes to avoiding data races. I want to conclude with um, just a few words on performance. I just couldn't resist it, um, to do that. So here are the top three, but um, that's like my top three of today. Um, there's more. Uh, I just wanted to list some of the bigger things. First of all, the reason why many OpenMP applications do not scale is there's too much parallel overhead. And the big one there is that there are too many parallel regions. Each parallel region carries a certain amount of overhead. When you have too many, that adds up. And then there's a thing called Amdahl's Law, which will uh, quickly uh, ruin your scalability. So try to work, cram as much work as possible in a single parallel region or at least minimize the number of parallel regions that you have. Another reason could be load balancing. That's more, more a characteristic of the algorithm where some threads do more work than others. For example, when you work on a, on a triangular matrix, some threads have a lot more work than others. Uh, so um, they all wait for the longest uh, thread to finish and that's bad for scalability. 
there's the schedule clause and tasking to help you out with uh, with that. So take a look at that if that's your scenario. Last but not least, a really big topic, non-uniform memory access, NUMA. Um, most systems today are NUMA and um, there's not really an easy escape from that. That's just the hardware. It's a topic in itself. There are several talks about uh, NUMA tuning. It's quite a well-covered topic, I think. Uh, so see if you can find some more information on that. Essentially, what you're going to do, you're going to experiment with the OpenMP affinity-related environment variables. Affinity is like a different word for NUMA. You want to keep your threads and data closed, so you want to, you want to increase the affinity. Uh, and there are environment variables in OpenMP to, um, to help you out with that. Again, um, I, I'm one of the people that have given talks about it, but I'm definitely not the only one. So there's a lot of information on that. In summary, uh, I covered some major mistakes that I've seen throughout the years. Unfortunately, these or other could happen to you too. I hope not, but you never know. And I hope you found, uh, found this, uh, this useful. One thing that I didn't say yet is what really helpful is to have regular, uh, checks for correctness. Make sure you have some validated data set or data sets and make sure you check for correct, uh, correct results quite often. Don't, don't start developing your OpenMP application, work on it for two weeks only to find out that you have a wrong result. Don't do that. You can add OpenMP in quite a grand, uh, gradual way. Make sure that you regularly check that you, you didn't uh, make a mistake and got the wrong results. The performance issues are the tip of the iceberg. Uh, I just mentioned a few. It's a big tip. I mean, these are very common cases where there's a lot more. In any case, make sure that you always use a profiling tool to guide you with the tuning uh, so that you know where to spend uh, your time to reduce the total time. Before I go, um, this um, this uh, slide lists uh, the OpenMP.org website, a great uh, place to go for all your OpenMP-related information. We also have videos and PDFs of uh, the SE22 presentations. Here's the link. Go and check it out. Uh, there will be a lot of SE22 material there. So thank you very much for your time. As always, stay tuned. I hope you found this useful. And remember, if somebody comes to you and says, OpenMP does not scale, please correct that person and say, bad OpenMP does not scale. Again, I hope you found it um, this useful. Good luck with developing your OpenMP application and bye for now.